Welcome, everybody. We are here for week number two of Concha y Café um, and working on now volume six, issue number two of our sixth year of publication, which every time that I, that I, that I say that or, or think about that, I'm just like, damn, you know, we're, we're kind of kind of getting up there in, in the, uh, the time period of Distal Arts' formation. So, um, so it's really cool. And it, it's, I'm hoping that all of you that were part of the last series finally got your copies of um, issue number one. Uh, at least I know Karen uh, let me know that she got hers, and um, it's a it's a thick one. It's it's a it's a fat baby, for sure. Um, issue number one, yeah, there you go, Mauricio. Uh, is I mean, it's I think over 200 pages if I remember correctly. So um, it's the biggest uh, Conchessi Cafe zine that we've done to date, and um, definitely looking forward to. to either matching that or maybe even surpassing that this time around. Um, so being that this whole series, this 12 week series uh, that we're currently on is all about characterization. You know, I'm not really gonna, gonna teach too much in terms of, um, you know, new techniques and, and, or new vocabulary words, I should say, uh, related to, to characterization. Um, but you know there there are different techniques that we can use to talk about um, characterizing uh, either people, um, places, things, objects, all of that. And you know the the lesson that we had last week about um, you know just the way that we maybe compare ourselves to other people in our lives, or the way that we might examine relationships and how they affect us. You know, that's one way of characterizing ourselves through poetry um, and also in part characterizing another another figure. Um, and I know that at least the assignment when I gave it last week, it might have been kind of personal. And, you know, those of you that did already share some work um, with me in Google Classroom, you know, I could tell that there was there was a bit of introspection going on, but. I wanted to open it up to everybody and just sort of see what, what your feelings were after last week's session and um, if you had any insights that you all wanted to share uh, after, after our, our session last week. Anybody have any thoughts? I know one person actually posted on the stream about having an existential breakthrough. Uh, which is kind of cool to see. <laughs> that was me. That was um, you? Okay. And I, uh, it started from the minute that, that we started reading Viktor Frankl's quote. And I, I wasn't, you know, it was the first class, and I don't know most of the people in the class, so I was like, do I really want to get that deep with, you know, the most, probably most personal, deepest, darkest, you know, secrets on the first class? I wasn't prepared to do that. Um, and then I had a whole, whole other breakthrough in the process of writing, um, uh, completing the assignment. And um, so it's, it's just been very very interesting I, I didn't expect to go that to go there um, but yeah it's um it it, it, uh, it was speaking directly to um, uh, an inquiry that I'm in with myself right now with my life with my job where you know where it's going why am I in it um, and so first of all I realized that that it's 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 a job that I never thought that I would do, but because I'm immersed and absolutely committed to the cause, it's allowed me to become something that I, I didn't think I could be. Hmm. And um, that part has been very interesting to, to find myself becoming more than I imagined that I could be doing. But then also I've been, um, I really want to transition to being a full-time writer, artist, producer, mm -hmm. and I've been wanting to do that for a while, but um, there's a part of me that's afraid that I won't accomplish in that creative life what I'm doing in, um, in my job right now. Mm -hmm. And 
that kind of woke me up to the fact that what I need is to be very tuned into that higher purpose mm -hmm. that, that makes my art not just about me, but about the difference that I want to make, the legacy I want to leave behind, you know, um, the impact I'm, I'm trying to make on my community, and that that, can, that might make all the difference on what I'm able to produce. And so that was, that was a breakthrough that I was having in the class. Mm -hmm. And then I had a whole other thing that happened as I was, you know, right after I finished writing, sometimes you write something and you don't understand what you're writing really. And then looking back on it, you go, Oh God, <laughs> wow. That's okay. Cause sometimes you're, your subconscious or your higher self or your angels or whatever you believe are speaking through you to you. And anyway, mm -hmm. that, that I had two major, major breakthroughs. I very, very un, unexpected. So thank you um, to the, to you, Luis, um, for the, the choice of uh, our reading material to the rest of the class for, for the space that you provided. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that, and and I can very much appreciate the, uh, you know, the fact that, that you feel like you you, um, you know, learned something that, that helped you on a personal level. I think that, you know, that that's that's one of the beautiful things about writing, and and uh, I certainly always hope that people feel that way when when we have our workshops, and and specifically. Um, feeling like they're a part of our community here because yeah I want this always to be a safe space for for everyone to express themselves and to feel like they have a purpose um, and are at least you know I want to I want to say fulfilling the purpose that they know that they that that they have here on, on this planet and during this time so um, so yeah thank you for, for for sharing that and also thank you for for writing what you wrote um, I see that there there is a request for you to share your piece from from Abraham. Uh, it is a bit of a longer one, but if you feel comfortable yeah, sharing it, guys. you may regret saying that. <laughs> um, um, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to print. I'm trying to print. I, I like um, the the line break um, recommendations that you made, Louise, and so mm -hmm. I'm trying to print that version. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, the way I have to go through a few extra steps in order for it to print properly, huh. I think I can do it now. Okay. Well, if we have time, uh, maybe later. Yeah, uh, I'm going to have to do it now. Yeah, yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a chance to, to share it. And the same goes for anybody else that, that would like to share anything that they, they wrote this week. Um, but, uh, yeah, the... Um, Hopefully this week we can we can have a very similar uh, experience with with uh, you know the the whole lesson and everything. So with that, I'll go ahead and begin sharing my screen here with everyone. Uh, hopefully you all will be able to see it, and if not, you know I'll try try my best to make sure that you are able to hear what's going on. Um, so. Our quote of the week, we have, again, two quotes that, that I felt were appropriate to, to this lesson. Um, and because characterization, like I said, you know, we can characterize things in a lot of different ways. Uh, this week, I was really thinking about, you know, what are, what are the things that, that, we, that we own that, you know, kind of characterize us or the things that we can attribute to someone um, when we say empty out your pockets, you know, how can, how can that, that characterize them? But I found this quote, this first one, from Gillian Flynn. Um, Gillian Flynn is an American writer. Uh, she's actually published three different novels, and all three of them have been adapted into either a TV show um, or a movie. Uh, the most famous one is probably Good Girl. And um, she wrote, The face you give the world tells the world how to treat you. Y aquí para ustedes que, que nos están acompañando, que prefieren en español, uh, Gillian Flynn escribió, La cara que le das al mundo, le dice al mundo cómo tratarte. So, it's a pretty straightforward quote, I think. Um, 
But what do you guys think about that? What do you think about the uh, quote that we just reviewed? And I'll paste it in Spanish in the chat as well. Well, it kind of reminds me of, of how we have multiple ways of approaching the world. I guess sometimes we have our interior persona, the one we think we want to be, and that's the one we actually uh, give the world. And that's the other one that we think how other people see us. And I think the one that's the most important is the actual facts that we, the things that we actually do in the world instead of the ones we think we are. So if we put that out into the world, if we're good, if we help, that's what we're going to receive, not what we think we are doing. Yeah, I think it does kind of go back to what Ani was saying about the, the um, Frankel quote from last week, right? Like, you give yourself to something, you know, and you present that out to the world. That's that's partially how the world is gonna gonna view you, but then also, you know, how you might end up viewing yourself. Um, so, yeah, it's a good interpretation. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? I had a couple of uh, thoughts with it. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that came to mind to me was kind of like what role we have in society, whether it's like through our occupation or what we do for a living. Because I think that's like one facet. It seems like that quote is multifaceted. Like, it, I think at one point also, like, it's the face that we're given as well as how the world treats you. And sometimes we don't get to choose how people are going to treat us based on, say, like, where we come from or the color of our face. So, I mean, I think, you know, I think this is a little bit more empowering, but I think it, should, it needs to be addressed that sometimes the face that we put out to the world may not be, like, the way that we want the world to treat us, even if our best intention is to, like, you know, be treated well. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? This is very true. That's why I think that this quote is, you know, it's an interesting quote, like you said, Mauricio. It is multifaceted. You know, it can be taken in a lot of different ways. I mean, a mí a veces me ven, you know, cara de pandillero, or at least in the past, right? Like in the past, I've been, I've been stereotyped as as a gang member. I mean, especially when I used to uh, buzz my hair. Uh, you know, so that's that's definitely a thing, right? Or I can't necessarily go out into the world wearing a flannel without someone being like, oh, you know, that, that guy's like an old school cholo. So, you know, that, that, is, that is partially true. Right. Miss Luz? Yes? <laughs> I just want to say this quote reminds me of um, uh, my last partner used to say, yeah, cambia la cara. I'd be like, what face do I have right now? Mm -hmm. How can I change my face? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and it is very difficult to know what you are projecting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether sometimes you know you you are going through like pain, anxiety, or some sort of discomfort, and um, and it it's obviously going to come through. Uh, but you know, there's no way of you knowing you know what what you are and you would like to change it sometimes you, you can't because uh, it's just what what and uh, it also just made me think of a, as a psychological term as far as projecting hmm. um, uh, I know I learned it in school a long time ago uh, that and I was trying to read up on it right now, but apparently we, you know, we are, uh, what other people think, um, or is it trying to say, what you think we're projecting, uh, me. Yeah. You're kind of cutting in and out there, Miss Luce. Um, so oh, okay. I'm not sure exactly what what that last little bit was that you were saying, but um, 
but I, th I think I, I kind of got some of what you were saying in terms of like the idea of projecting. Um, so yeah, I think that that's also another, another part of this quote, right? It's kind of like what I was saying, you know, if, if I go out into the world wearing a flannel, right. And, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm wearing like other camping gear or something like that, you know, somebody might see me and, and say, oh, you know, that's, that's, that's a pandillero. But that's also probably that person's experience seeing a brown man wearing, you know, a flannel and that's them projecting their past experience onto me. And so in that sense, you know, the, the way that I'm presenting myself to the world might determine how the world will, will then view me um, and treat me. So and, and in some ways, yeah, that, that is a form of projection, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Abraham? It made me think of that, that um, line that they always tell you. Um, we, we teach people how to treat us um, based on how, how we act or what we're willing to put up with. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's what we get. And I, and also had me thinking about, I remember, um, I was working in television and I had kind of a role where I was advising producers on, um, legal issues. And I remember the day I brought my CD and pinned it to my cubicle. And from that day forward, I could get no respect because <laughs> they were like, ah, you're just some flaky musician, artist. We can't trust you to give us hmm. legal advice. And it was just, uh, it was really interesting to see how um, people put you in a little box. Mm -hmm. And now from one day to the next, um, they just think of you and treat you differently. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Abraham, what is a CD? Just kidding. <laughs> For those that might not be aware, a CD is a small circular thing that you used to use to listen to music and or burn uh, information and other types of data onto. <laughs> BJ Abraham. But, you know, to be fair. <laughs> you own some, we know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it also kind of uh, makes me think about, for example, I was listening to this podcast on this family who adopted uh, kids who were black and they were white, mm -hmm. and how some people cannot change that face into the world because they're born with that face in these terms of color and how they're being treated just because of that mm -hmm. simple fact. I think that's another part of society that needs to be reorganized, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, it doesn't really matter so much, you know, our, our background, the way that we grew up, you know, you could be a, a person of color that grows up wealthy, but ultimately the world will still see you as a person of color, you know, and in some ways, the way that you look will always predetermine the way that you are treated. Um, and, you know, sometimes the things that we surround ourselves with or the, the things that we that we wear, like I said, you know, can also uh, determine the way that the way that we uh, are, are treated in the world. And that's why I think the second quote that I uh, found for us this week is, is also uh, an interesting one and a unique one that I that I feel um, definitely deserves us examining and, and discussing. Um, this one comes from Donna Haraway, and Donna Haraway uh, is a feminist and um, a scholar, as, as Wikipedia called her, uh, in the field of science and technology. Um, como feminista y catedrática, uh, ella ha escrito varios ensayos y libros um, sobre la, las ideas de, de las ciencias y tecnología y cómo, cómo nos afecta como, como, este, como humanos, como seres. Um, some, of, some of the quotes that, that I found from Donna Haraway were, were pretty interesting, but this one in particular I thought was, was uh, very appropriate to, um, to today's lesson. And she wrote, Possession, property, is about reciprocity and rights of access. If I have a dog, my dog 
as a human. Y aquí traducido lo traducía posesión, propiedad. Se trata de la reciprocidad y los derechos de acceso. Si tengo a un perro, mi perro tiene a un humano. I'll go ahead and copy that for us and put that in the chat. So what does that quote say to you? ¿Cómo les parece lo que dice Donna Haraway? I kind of like this quote um, a little bit better than the first one. Hmm. Um, only because I think the second one also kind of lowers, I guess, that power of the, I guess, the speaker in terms of saying there's equal, I guess, level for, I guess, both um, the dog and the human in this example, but mm -hmm. kind of like, like that idea of property also. It's, um, there's always like a certain, like, there's one person that owns something, whether it's like a piece of land or, you know, or a house or, you know, or even something living. And I think it takes away from that idea that you are the master of this thing. And in terms of like, you are also, you're also a master, but you also have responsibility to take care of this thing that you now own. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of like, it, it takes away that idea that, yeah, you own something, but you also have to take care of it. And in terms of this thing, person, place, or thing now has ownership of you as well. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of like a mutual, you know, uh, investment. Oh, I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you guys. You know, one of the things that, that in the past has scared me about being a homeowner is the idea that I would be a homeowner, you know, and that I would then be obligated to take care of that home um, and not rely on someone else to take care of it. And, you know, in the eyes of society, If I own a house, if I own property, you know, that elevates me to a certain level of status. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's, you know, not for me to say, but, um, but I know what it, how it makes me feel, right? And I know that, um, at least for me, I, I don't always feel comfortable with the idea of being a homeowner at some point in my life, right? Posesión, propiedad. Se trata de la reciprocidad y los derechos de acceso. Si tengo a un perro, mi perro tiene a un humano. What else does that say to you? What does that say about, you know, maybe the way that people might treat us? I mean, I have a, a dog in my life now, so when I'm out walking the dog, You know, people see me as a dog owner, and because it's a puppy, you know, people are much more happier walking up to me, being the big brown man that I am, right? So there's something there, right, about how a possession, a, an item, an object, changes people's perception of me. Abraham? Well, yeah, it kind of has many levels in this um, fragment of... of Uh, writing, for example, it could be uh, about a relationship status, how we portray ourselves as the person holding the, the steers, I guess, in a relationship. Or it could also be in parts of a possession about things. And for example, we're talking about nature, how we think about land, right? Especially as we pollute it and we think about it's our country, it's our like our home, it's our state or whatever, and we don't think about it being ours, like the earth is our home, right? Like it's part of us as well. So we we have that kind of equality in it. So we screw up, we're screwing ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to add to Abraham too, and we don't like, sometimes people don't see land as a living thing as well. Mm -hmm. So they treat it as something that's like, you know, that's not living and we pollute it and we don't take care of it. We don't think of the repercussions of 
our presence and what we do with it. And mm -hmm. yeah, you're right, it does shoot us in the foot, but it also like takes it worse for other generations and just even other people. You don't even have to go that far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and there's definitely something I think to um, to the idea of relationships and what that what a title might give um, an individual, like what Vero is saying in the chat, right? Especially when it comes to women, right? If a woman is considered to be someone's wife um, in society, there's a lot of a lot of things that come with that. Uh, in el pasado, el ser casado y, y ser la esposa de un, de un hombre. Um, Eso significaba que, que un, un ser era la propiedad de un hombre, right? Um, to be considered someone else's property is traditionally what marriage meant in the past. And it's only really been in the last, like, maybe 100, 150 years where that's kind of changed, but not even that much, right? Um, so, yeah, the, the idea of, of possession, um, you know, it, it it also is, I think, a way of labeling. Any other thoughts? Ms. Luz? I just want to share. Ah, mm -hmm. When you were saying, I'm sorry, I, I unmuted myself because I raised my hand and I thought you had. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you, but go ahead. I was, I'm sorry. I was, um, I, at first I was like, okay, what the heck? What is all this? I'm trying to make sense of the stuff that is being said. And when you mention your example, you know, like you have a puppy and you walk the puppy, mm -hmm. you know, and relating it to character or characterization, I think that the fact that if you would have been walking alone without that puppy, maybe nobody would come to you, like you said, but because you own this dog, it changes your, your character or what people may think about you. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and because I'm also thinking of you with a flannel shirt, you know, compared to you, maybe you um, you're walking down with a, some kind of a pair of tennis shoes that are very expensive. That gives you character. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I don't know if they're the right one, but, but you're right, you know, that what we own characterizes us. And I was thinking mm -hmm. also, when you were talking about the house, owning property, mm -hmm. to me, somebody that owns property, wow, can afford it. Because I don't have a house. Mm -hmm. I rent. And I'm in the process of buying property. But anytime that I hear, oh, no, yeah, yeah, they, they have a house and it's paid for. I'm like, wow, how do you? I guess because I, I come from Texas. You know, Texas mm -hmm. is so expensive. In Texas, I have property. I'm even renting a house, but I pay like three or four times as much as I get from my rent in Texas. Mm -hmm. So to me, owning property here says a lot about the person. So I guess, you know, I'm just, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that our possessions uh, do characterize us, you know, do say a lot about us. Mm -hmm. You mentioning the fact that you're walking your dog and you, it's a puppy, not a big dog. Maybe if you were a big dog, I would not come near you at all. But it's not a puppy. Maybe I'm thinking that you're a friendly, responsible guy. You know, <laughs> I think, I think that's that's yeah. what I was. Yeah. So I found the connection. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely. Yeah, and I can tell you right now. Um, you know, the puppy is an American Staffordshire Terrier. Immediately when people see the puppy. They think pit bull because that's what most people assume an American Staffordshire Terrier is, right? It's a very specific breed, um, but it's most commonly referred to as a pit bull. So when she's full grown, she'll be a beautiful dog, um, but she'll be a dog that a lot of people will be afraid of only because they don't understand, you know, the, the reputation that, that American Staffordshires actually have. Right? There's a lot of misconception. So your possessions can also create misconceptions of you, right? Like Ani's example of putting up her CD in her cubicle and then suddenly people think, oh, she's a flaky artist, right? 
um, which was honestly, you know, a, a very good example, Ani, of, you know, what, what um, people's perceptions can do to you, right, um, based on the objects that they see in your surroundings. Uh, Ms. Luce, you, you had something that, that you wanted to share, I believe. But I think this, um, this quote just, um, caused me, caused me to explore just the meaning of possession. Um, ultimately, I, recently I've been writing, um, helping my parents write their living trust, and uh, I have to do, I have to uh, work on mine as well. And uh, it just, it doesn't really feel like you own anything in actuality. If, uh, like you said, it is a sense of responsibility. Uh, to be a homeowner and uh, and it's just about utilizing things and uh, making putting them to their best use and then letting go of them so the whole concept of possession for me is becoming I guess looser a looser term uh, because uh, yeah like 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 the, with example with the dog um, they have responsibility to each other, right? The human to the dog and the dog to the human. So it's kind of like it takes two to tango, kind of that that quote. Also, it's like, it's a dance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, it, it does make, make you think. Uh, but ultimately, the, I like, I've been also contemplating the, this Buddhist concept that there is no me and no my. So I kind of am learning to like that concept. It's like, okay, my, the, myself is not important and what's quote unquote mine is not mine. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big idea to swallow because, you know, we're fed, you know, that our egos and the, we're so important, our individual self is so important, and our individual things are so important. So we're clinging in to hanging on to ourself and hanging on to our things. And uh, I'm finding that it's, it's kind of nice to, to let go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's yeah. my take. Yeah. I think it's also really important for us to understand that we actually make the choices of owning what we own, right? So the possessions that we that we own, the things that we, we consider ourselves to be owners of, we own them because we wanted them. We wanted it in our life, or it was gifted to us because that's what someone thought we would like, right? I mean, we're coming up on the holiday season. I know personally, I, I like to get gifts, um, and especially when I get like tequila, Miss Luz, shout out, uh, <laughs> you know, the reason why I got tequila was because that's something that that you know about me, and you understand that that's that's the type of thing that I would enjoy. Um, but the same goes for like say you know a pair of, uh, like a like a bag of socks, right? That I've received on Christmas from my mom. You know, it's it's possessions that came into my life because I, they were needed, and you know, a, the style of the sock was a style that my mom knew I would like because that's something that I identify with. Um, you know, so, so we can be identified with certain types of clothing or we can be identified with, you know, a particular design style uh, because, you know, we might be into like, say, mid-century modern, um, I don't know, design styles, right? Like, so there's there's a lot of different ways in which we can label ourselves based on the the objects that we surround ourselves by. Um, hopefully that makes sense. All right, steampunk. There you go. Abraham is is all about steampunk. Uh, Vero, I see your your hand up. I know that you guys were talking about like gifts. I just realized that um, I. The kids don't get gifts for Christmas or for their birthdays on purpose. I stopped doing that a couple, I know, I stopped doing that a few years ago. And it's because I realized that it was a big insecurity of mine. Growing up, I was really poor. And I remember 
putting my mom through hell because having possessions made me feel like I wasn't as poor um, when we were fucking poor. And and after I realized that, I was like, I want my kids to think that their value comes from possessions. Mm -hmm. So I stopped doing that. And in response, my family thinks they have to make up for my shortcomings. Hmm. So they go all out of their way. And I'm like, no, no. So the kids, like, for Christmas, for birthdays, we don't do any. I'm like, no, that it's a day and we're going to celebrate by being together. Mm -hmm. So they start making plans, like, because they need to have that possession that comes from, like, the outside world. But as you guys were talking about it, as you were talking about gifts and we were talking about this quote, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm an asshole because I try to, like, keep them from possessions as much as I can. Mm. But I realized that in a world that's so commercialized and so mm -hmm. dominated by things, I'm losing them. It's, a, it's an attempt. <laughs> Well, you have to know, like, gifts doesn't have to be something, like, expensive or anything. It just has to be something. It can be an activity, like you said, or something special. It doesn't have to be something that you buy. Vera, I can definitely relate with you. Um, like, from my dad's side of the family, my grandmother and dad have always been, like, well off. And my mom was kind of like, you know, she was kind of a, a victim, I guess, to, like... I guess, like, that Western side of, like, okay, you have to buy stuff to make yourself feel worthy. And so she would get into a lot of debt over that. Mm -hmm. And it took, like, us a long time to kind of get over the fact that, like, we don't need new objects or, like, this new stuff. Like, it was almost like we were buying stuff to kind of fill the void of, like, what we were really missing. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, we, like, I always, like, she always tells me, she's still kind of in that, in that way, but... She always asks me, what do you want for Christmas, for Thanksgiving? Like, I just want to be, you know, like, present. Like, whether it's a half-hour call or we could do Zoom or Skype or something. You know, mm -hmm. it's stuff like that. And I remember talking to, like, you know, my cousins who were totally against that. And they would say, like, we never buy our nephews or anything, any toys. But when we're there, we're all about them. We're all about making those memories and playing with them and singing with them, whatever they want to do. They want to imagine dragons in the, in the sky, let's do it. And I think those are what kids remember more than just, oh, I got the new Barbie doll or I got the new like Marvel you know, action figures. <laughs> he man for Abraham there. <laughs> uh, for me growing up, it would have been either Transformers or Voltron, one of the two. Yeah. Um, and, you know, yeah, possessions don't necessarily always have to be like, like an actual object, right? Our, our most valued possessions can sometimes be our memories, you know? Um, although we do remember well those things we really wanted to, <laughs> that we were denied at Christmas. Yeah, that's very true, honey. That's very true. Um, and Miss Michelle in the chat is saying, I've never seen a U-Haul following a hearse. In other words, you cannot take it with you, and memories are important. So I think that's a very good thing to remember, right? Um, and no, Vero, you're not the Grinch. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Nikolai would rather have the action figure. Yeah, there you go. Um, but... Uh, yeah, ultimately, I, I just I think that it's important for us to remember, right? That it's it, it comes down to I think the things that we value, and and you know, sometimes we don't realize that we value them um, in the act, but as we write about it, right? As we kind of reflect, you know, we can we can realize, oh, you know, that transformer toy that I had when I was four years old, and I took it to my show and tell and in kindergarten, you know, that particular toy means a lot to me because it was the gateway for the other kids in my kindergarten class to actually like me. After I brought in that toy for show and tell, it was a sign that I was just like the other kids, even though all the little white boys and girls in my kindergarten class couldn't really understand who I was because I was the only little Mexican boy 
in my class and the only one that spoke Spanish and could kind of half speak English, right? So it, w- it was a gateway. That's why that particular toy is so important to me. Um, and I don't think I ever realized that until a few years ago when I was actually going through all the toys and I, that I still had um, and realized I had that one particular Transformer toy from when I was four years old. So, you know, we, we definitely are defined in some ways by the objects that we own. Um, and it doesn't necessarily always mean that they define us as for, for the type of thing that they are, right? Um, it could be just, you know, some sort of trauma that we, that we overcame. And, you know, now we, now we have that thing and we could say, yes, I'm proud because I accomplished this or whatever the case might be. Um, and, and ultimately it comes down to the memories. So, uh, I see a a conversation happening in the chat about pharaohs and the Egyptians and, and, you know, taking their possessions with them. Um, sure. You you guys can be that way. Uh, I, I think I'd rather live with my memories. Um, pero para seguir con la lección, hay que hablar un poquito más sobre la caracterización. Um, so last week, right, we, we talked about characterization and the definitions of that term, right? Y caracterización es la creación o construcción de un personaje ficticio. Y para mí también es muy importante entender que caracterización también significa una descripción de la naturaleza distinta o las características de alguien o algo. For me, it really is about that second definition of characterization, a description of the distinctive nature or features of someone or something. And the way that we can talk about that distinctive nature or the features of someone or something um, can be done in a lot of different ways. Last week, we talked about how, you know, we can do that in the way that we define our relationships with other people. Right, the impact that another person has on our life, you know, we might write about them, but the words that we use to talk about them characterize us as a speaker. The same goes for the objects that we write about. Y esta semana les traigo un poema que viene de Jorge Luis Borges. Uh, para, para los que no conocen a Jorge Luis Borges, es o fue más bien un uh, poeta argentino. Uh, que vivió durante los, este, los últimos años del de siglo XIX y inicios del de siglo XX. Um, the translation that's here is actually provided or done by Stephen Kessler. Um, and I pulled this particular uh, poem from a book uh, that is a collected uh, works of Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentinian poet from the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century. Um, ¿Hay alguien que gusta leer para nosotros el poema de, de Jorge Luis Borges? Any volunteers? You could be either reading the English or the Spanish, whichever one you want. Feel free to unmute yourselves and say hi. Anyone? Fine, I'll do it. All right. <laughs> I just read it right now for the first time, so. Okay. Things by Jorge Luis Borges. My cane, my pocket change, this ring of keys, the obedient lock, the belated notes, the few days left to me will not find time to read the deck of cards, the tabletop, a book and crush in its pages the withered violet monument to an afternoon undoubtedly unforgettable, now forgotten. The mirror in the west where a red sunrise blazes its illusion. How many things, files, door sills, atlases, wine glasses, nails, serve us like slaves who never say a word, blind and so mysteriously reserved. They will endure beyond our vanishing, and they will never know that we have gone. Excellent. Thank you, Annie. I like this poem. Yeah, I like this poem a lot too. 
tengo por ahí un voluntario que gusta leer el poema para nosotros en español. Yo lo puedo leer. Por favor. Las cosas. Jorge Luis Borges. El bastón. Las monedas. El llavero. La dócil cerradura. Las tardías notas que no leerán los pocos días que me quedan. Los naipes y el tablero. Un libro y en sus páginas la ajada violeta. Monumento de una tarde, sin duda un olvidable, inolvidable y ya olvidada. El rojo espejo occidental en que arde una ilusora aurora. ¿Cuántas cosas? Limas, umbrales, atlas, copas, clavos, nos sirven como tacitos esclavos. Ciegas y extrañamente sigilosas, durarán más allá de nuestro olvido. No sabrán nunca que nos hemos ido. Muy bien. Muchísimas gracias. Excellent reading from the two of you. ¿Y cómo les parece este poema? ¿Qué significa para ustedes el poema? What are your initial thoughts? <laughs> Cuba. Like it. Soy tu amigo fiel. Abraham, is that what it, it, it brought for you? Well, it's about objects, right? It says that mm -hmm. they're going to miss you, but uh, about to Toy Story said the other ways. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good, good, actually, series of movies when, when you think about, like, you know, objects, right? And their value. Pero que más? ¿Qué más piensan sobre el poema? Well, it kind of, it kind of tells like a, the story about like possessions, how we think about them. <laughs> But to me, because I, I also don't have as much stuff as I sh should. <laughs> But I feel that things serve purposes. Mm -hmm. For example, for memories, like my guitar over there, My dad gave me that guitar, so it holds a meaning to me. So every time that I play or see it, it reminds me of that. So things are not just things to show up that are, they have value in like modern world, like how much they cost or how my status is, but they have different meanings. That's why we have museums full of all these things, right? Right. I think uh, I agree with that. I think like what you said, like what's most important is like that you, I guess the possessor are the ones that give it value. Mm -hmm. you know? Definitely. Honey? Um, it was making me think of, um, you know, when, when someone close to you passes away mm -hmm. um, and you have things that were part of their daily life and that meant a lot to them um, or were, were part of them. We have, um, It was a particular spoon that my father would only use to stir his tea. And when he passed away, we put that spoon in his mug that he always used, and we put up on this top shelf. <laughs> no one else uses that spoon. Mm. And um, there's so many things like that, you know, around the house, and and what things we got rid of and what things we kept, um, but ultimately. You know, those things, there's only so much of that stuff you can keep. Mm -hmm. um, they don't bring that person back. They don't bring them back to life. None of that, you know, you just, they're just things, but they've mm -hmm. lost the, uh, they lost their soul and their spirit when the person who was connected to those things is gone. That, this makes me feel a little sad, this poem. You know, like yeah. a, like a puppet show where you see the puppets dancing and whatever, and then when the puppeteer lets go of the strings, they just fall to the ground mm -hmm. like this. You know that these um, these objects had a, had a life mm -hmm. and um, and a purpose because they were they meant something and they served a purpose for someone. And when that person is gone, now they're just generic objects. You know. Yes, the yeah. essence of the person who owned them, exactly. Yeah, 
Yeah. I think that that's, that's definitely, you know, the, the case, right? Like, um, when my uh, grandma passed away, my mommy Lucy, as, as we called her in my family, um, it, it fell on, on my mom and my, my tia Lisa to basically clear out her bedroom. And they found stacks and stacks and stacks of blankets. And my mommy Lucy was from Oaxaca, from a small town in the mountains of Oaxaca. And the story goes that even though being in Oaxaca, which is known to be a very, you know, tropical area, um, my mommy Lucy grew up so poor that she actually grew up always cold. And so the fact that she was always cold growing up, whenever she was, you know, able to buy a blanket, she would buy a blanket. And that resulted in her having an excess of blankets in her bedroom. So much so that she couldn't even store them. And a lot of them ended up getting moldy and had to be thrown away when she passed away. So, you know, the objects that, that we have in our life, you know, they say something about us to a certain degree. Um, and it's something that I think that, that, you know, you assign that value. But a person looking in from the outside can say, you know, oh, Abraham likes to play guitar, right? I didn't know that that was a guitar that his dad gave him. You know, every time that I've seen Abraham in these videos, I see the guitar in the background and I see his paintings and I think, yeah, he's, he's an artist, you know? Le encanta la música. Es músico y artista y, you know, Abraham's cool. I can relate to that, you know, because I have a guitar too. I consider myself an artist too, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, his side gig, uh, mariachi. <laughs> what does the poem say about the speaker of the poem? A, a bohemian starter pack. That, that's really good, Carlos. I like that a lot. <laughs> um, bohemio de aficion. ¿Qué, ¿Qué es lo que nos dice el poema sobre este, el hablante del poema? I'm going to switch back here to, to present the, the screen. Uh, Luis? Yes. I don't know if it's right or not, but I felt like the speaker was frustrated that they wouldn't remember him. Mm. You know, like he would remember maybe his objects, but I guess there would no be, there wouldn't be any memory of him mm. behind to his objects, almost like the objects were living and could remember things, you know, like mm -hmm. I remember my user, I guess like in the same essence of what Abraham was talking about, you know, with Toy Story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the poem is is definitely a poem that reflects a type of sadness. Um, you know, there, there there is a kind of sadness to this poem that that does sort of lament the fact that the objects that we that we surround ourselves by won't remember us. And it is maybe a poem about memory, right? And por ejemplo, tenemos aquí. Un libro y en sus páginas la ajada violeta, monumento de una tarde, sin duda inolvidable, ya olvidada. You know, there's, there's kind of an irony, I think, there that, that's trying to be expressed. A book and crushed in its pages the withered violet, monument to an afternoon, undoubtedly unforgettable, now forgotten. Right, so the speaker of the poem obviously has books in their life, right? We can get that from this poem. And had at some point some sort of memory associated to the violet, to the flower that they put in the, in the middle of their book. But now they don't even remember why. So, you know, what else do the other objects in this, in this poem say to us about the speaker? What kind of a person do we think the speaker was? La primera vez que leí este poema, mm -hmm. recordé que Borges quedó ciego ya casi al final de su vida. Mm -hmm. Entonces él hablaba de que uno de sus dolores más grandes era ya no poder leer. Mm -hmm. Entonces era como su manera de decir todos los objetos que tengo como que no duran para siempre y era como 
su dolor más grande, como ya no poder leer uh -huh. o no poder escribir. Uh -huh. Entonces yo lo veo de una manera como de desapego por parte de él, como de sí, tengo todas estas cosas, pero es como que me tengo que ir despegando porque estoy perdiendo la vista. Entonces, uh -huh. no sé, me recuerdo como esa parte de, de su vida, uh -huh. como muy íntima, como como muy fuerte de, de, uh -huh. de que okay, es lo que más amo pero es lo que voy a perder entonces uh -huh. un poco más de desapego uh -huh. sí y, y quizás sabiendo eso de, de, de Borges y su vida nos puede influir la manera en que, en que leemos este poema pero más allá de eso ¿qué es lo que sabemos del de, de hablante de, de este poema? ¿Qué dice los objetos que él reconoce en el poema sobre él? I think that, uh -huh. bueno, déjenme decirlo en español. Se oye como una lamentación uh -huh. lo que se oye. That's what it sounds like to me. Uh -huh. Porque y yo pienso, pienso yo, que a veces los humanos tenemos uh, crisis de este tipo. Uh -huh que sabemos que vamos a quedar en el olvido un día. Pienso yo porque, por ejemplo, ¿Does everybody understand me? Because I'm speaking Spanish. I can... Yeah, you know, I think that, I think that in the long, you know, we know that eventually we're going to be forgotten. You know, my kids will probably, you know, save some of my, you know, beloved books autographed by my favorite author. Hmm. You know, items, but then again, one day, You know, that's going to remain, that's going to go somewhere. Maybe they're going to forget why I kept it or they're going to go on with their lives and then eventually, you know, it's going to be forgotten and I will be forgotten. Maybe, you know, their kids and... So it sounds like como que está lamentando el hecho de que un día se va a olvidar completamente. O sea, se va a, olvidar, se va a, va a ser en el olvido completamente. Mm -hmm. So it sounds, para mí es una lamentación. Mm -hmm. Uh, y parece como que tiene un dolor se ve como que tiene un dolor yo no, o sea, yo conozco a José no lo conozco en persona, ¿no? pero uh -huh. yo he leído de él, pero este nunca lo había leído uh -huh. y sin haberlo leído es lo que sentí cuando lo iba leyendo que a veces tenemos ¿cómo se dice? crisis existencial uh -huh. crisis so that's what it sounds like to me That he was probably going through something like that and you know, realizing that we're nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that we're gonna be nothing one day and you know, in a hundred years nobody's gonna know that we existed. And so I guess that's that's more like an ex existential crisis that he could have been going through. And that's again, that's my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, and I think that that's, that's a very, very astute uh, interpretation. Um, igual como Paola, you know, es, es un tipo de crisis que está, mm, hay que decir, sufriendo por falta de mejor palabra. Uh, Mauricio, I see your hand up, and then Abraham. I was looking, at, I guess, at the actual objects themselves to see what story they told, and I guess I was looking at, like, atlases, wine glasses, the files. I'm thinking if maybe he was a wine drinker since he had multiple mm -hmm. wine glasses. Maybe he was social because he had multiple wine glasses for friends to come over. Mm -hmm. Maybe he laments that loneliness as well. Atlases could mean either he, was a, he traveled or he was an intellectual or he just liked, you know, knowing more about the world, which can also be surmised by like the book that he has I think he's like an artist I guess like you know just someone that appreciates like reading and knowledge and stuff like that he also talked about pocket change so I don't mm -hmm. know if that had to do with maybe he wasn't maybe someone of wealth or maybe he just had enough to get by I mean the cane also you know he was obviously older or you know needed help with the cane mm -hmm. so like things like that and the ring of keys like you know I'm thinking, does he have, you know, multiple things that he locks away? Does he have things that he is not in the line of sight? But does he have multiple properties or houses? So, like, those type of questions came to me as mm -hmm. I was actually going through the objects. It's really interesting to see, like, an object and kind of make that story up about person, you know, 
Exactly, exactly. And I think that that's important, right? Yes, the poem is a sad poem. Um, es un lamento, sin duda, es un lamento. Pero el hecho de que él escogió tales objetos, tales cosas que, que representan el poema, eso significa algo. Abraham? Well, as uh, Mauricio mentioned, yeah, the cane is one of the big clues for me because it means it's a, it's more like an older person and it's help, but it doesn't have anybody else to help him to be sound that way. And then it says, uh, the few days left to me will not find time. And then it starts going to the words that kind of go darker, you know, like the crush, uh, wither, now forgotten kind of thing. And the fact that he mentions all these things, but he doesn't mention anybody, and then tells me that he probably was a single person with no kids. Mm -hmm. So usually people think somebody is going to remember them, mm -hmm. the family members, their kids, because that's how they think their memory is going to live on, right? But he just has things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even then, you know, having kids doesn't always necessarily mean you'll be remembered. Um, you know, so... That's, that's also hope. something to, yeah, yeah, you can hope that your kids will remember you. Um, not to be dark, but, you know, you, you can't have that expectation. We can't live with that expectation, I think. Um, My dog will. <laughs> yeah, your dog will remember you, sure. <laughs> uh, Carlos? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, um, yeah, I was wondering, I was like, when did he write this? Because... He was, I guess, towards the end of his life, he was pretty successful. And he, I guess, probably knew that his legacy was going to live, um, you know, through his books. Um, but I think that uh, this was maybe some type of, um, what do you call those, the time capsules? Mm. Maybe in a way to put, like, all those small things that, you know, very common everyday things that, you know, probably not, nobody ever saw. Just like put them into this form, man. Just kind of like someday somebody will be reading them, and and we'll just kind of like put that into thought. I don't know. That, that's what I just thought. Like kind of a time capsule, mm -hmm. and just kind of like knowing that he was aware of this, his uh, legacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm sure he was aware of of the legacy that he would have. I mean, um. Because by that point in his life, whenever this was written, you know, he probably had already at least published one book. Um, but I think that more than anything, it's important for us to, number one, remember that poets don't always write about themselves, right? That's why we say the speaker of the poem. El hablante, el, el personaje del poema, no siempre es el poeta. Es posible que es esté usando un, un, una voz literaria, right? So I think it's, it's really important that we try to remember that when we're talking about poetry because that's part of what characterization is. You know, characterization is a fabrication of a person. And any, any time that you write about yourself, you're ultimately fabricating a persona or, or a portion of who you are. So the objects that you might write about, you know, they don't necessarily explain everything about you. It's only a portion of you. El hecho de que el bastón es el primer objeto que él elige para, para empezar el poema, eso para mí significa que, que está diciendo, es un persona de la tercera, tercera uh, etapa en su vida, ¿verdad? Right? He, he's... he's the cane as the first object in this list is important because he's immediately telling us with the cane that he's an older person. At least that's the assumption that we've all made up to this point, right? And so, you know, that's, that's part of the characterization. You know, that is the, the essence. The, el, el, este, como, como dice nuestra definición, um, es este, la naturaleza distinta o las características de alguien o algo. Right? So the, the very specific word choice 
in choosing the atlases and the wine glasses and the nails and the door sills and all of the other objects that he chooses to represent in this poem. You know, they say something about the character of that speaker. Not necessarily the poet, but the speaker. Luis, you didn't you didn't write on here what what um, what era he's from because I have pictures of my from my grandfather's generation mm -hmm. where the professors, even though they were very young, they carry they each had a cane in, in the portraits mm -hmm. as it, it was a symbol of status, you know. Um, you know, that whole Sherlock Holmes feel, you know, you had a pipe and you had a cane mm -hmm. and it just it me meant that you were a man of some stature <laughs> to stop it, Abraham. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, so my first thing was either this is a man from a different era, mm. right? Um, and it's, and has, has a status, um, as a, as a, you know, from the intelligentsia or, mm -hmm. you know, something like that, an educated class, or yeah. he's like an older man who needs the cane to, yeah. you know, to get around. But yeah. the other, you know, the other images that he describes kind of fit that character, you know, the one who's in the study with the, you know, with an atlas open, who, who reads atlases, you know, it's not, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. so it could have gone either way. I was kind of leaving my mind open to see what he was up in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Miss Luis. <laughs> Luis, I just wanted to say that um, that for me the the key uh, statement he makes about una ilusoria aurora or just that life is an illusion uh, that he's come to that realization. That although he's established a relationship with, with the, the, the formed world around him, uh, that it hasn't established the same relationship with him. Mm. Mm. So. That's very profound. That is very <clears throat> very profound. I don't even know what to say to that. Honestly, I mean that's that's I think probably what the lament was, you know, that he may have placed almost too much value on those things and only to realize that after he's gone, those things won't remember him, you know, maybe the people in his life might remember him, but what happened to those people? They're not even in this, this poem. It could be also though, because he doesn't view people as possessions, right? So it could be that, you know, he, he, the speaker of the poem went through life having relationships, but not, or choosing not to treat those relationships as possessions, you know, as, as things that he would um, own or have control over. So he's maybe just simply acknowledging that He'll, he'll be alone in death, which is ultimately all of our destinies, is that we'll be all alone in, in death, but not alone in spirit, you know, because we'll hopefully live on through the legacy that we leave in our families, our friends, the works that we create, the works that we do in this world. So, yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> That's, that's all we can hope for, right? Um, so I think this conversation got pretty, pretty deep. <laughs> um, it got pretty kind of, kind of heavy. So I hope, I hope I'm going to trigger anybody. Este, <laughs> um, let's see, what is that metal? I also saw this as like lamenting now having an exit plan for his things. Like who would become responsible for responsible for them because maybe they were more than inanimate objects or things. Yeah, yeah, you know, who's going to be the caretaker of you know the puppy if something were to happen to me? Yeah, I already know who would take care of the puppy if something were to happen to me, but 
I have to say this. I do sometimes worry about like distill arts, right? What would happen to distill arts if I were to somehow no longer be around? You know, who's going to carry on the work that, that we do? Yeah, Abraham, you know, or the rest of the board members of distill arts, you know. Uh, so. Yeah. I have a different example, Luis. For the puppy. Uh, have, I mean, you're still very young, but if you ever, um, if you ever start looking at those unfinished projects and those things that you want to do, and mm -hmm. you start to get to a certain age and you think, I can't pass these on to anybody. Like no one's going to, no one's going to finish that unfinished song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no one's going to publish my, you know, no one's going to know what to do with all these journals I've kept. They only mean something to me. And if I fulfill on them and turn them into something, uh, into a product of, that can be passed on, great. But if I don't, then all of that work, all of those things that it meant to me, what I, what I imagined, what I dreamed, what I thought that, you know, lyric was going to become, what I thought that project was going to become, that all dies with me. And it, and it doesn't go anywhere. It's, um, the change can still be spent. The ring of keys can probably, you know, still unlock something by somebody else. But mm -hmm. there are certain things that if they're not, I'm not sure they can say. <laughs> I love this group. Can I just say, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm so, uh, I feel so fortunate to be in this group. Some really, really, um, uh, emotionally intelligent um, people in this group, and I, I'm just mm. very grateful to be here with you guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think I feel like I have to I have to burn my journals actually because <laughs> <laughs> you know I know what context I wrote those things in. I don't know if it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna fly <laughs> without me. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. There's, there's definitely, I think, something that's really important for all of us to remember. Um, you know, yes, to acknowledge the, the chat, right? We don't know what's going to happen to us at any given time. We don't know who's going to take on the project of publishing our journals or our sketchbooks, you know, after we pass. Um, and yes, you know, there's a probably more of a majority of artists that reach fame post-mortem. But that doesn't mean that we can't do it now, right? That doesn't mean that we, if we really truly believe in, in the message that we are writing, you know, that we can't take those steps to, to publish it now and to share with other people. Even if it's within a smaller community now, that doesn't mean that it won't get amplified later. So, you know, really, really, I think, take solace in the fact that you are now, right now, making the effort to put your work out there and that you are making the effort to have a legacy, you know, whether that be through publishing or that be through the work that you do in your everyday, or if it's something that's probably even more meaningful, like the way that you treat other people. You know, it doesn't take a lot to say hello to someone doesn't take a lot to share a smile, you know, when you see someone maybe not having a great day. You know, those little things, they have an impact, you know, and it ultimately comes down to what is it, what is the value that we're placing on the objects, you know. I'm going to keep my guitar for as long as I can, and I'm going to definitely keep my, my sketchbooks that I've had since I was like, you know, in high school, I think is the, is the oldest one. You know, I'm going to keep them until until I'm able to finally, uh, you know, scan all the drawings and stuff that I have. But um, you know, it's 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 I think more about the value that we place on ourselves, right? And the value that we place on ourselves is partly going to be reflected in the way that we present ourselves to the world and the objects that we choose to actually, you know, keep in our life. So ultimately, what this is building up to is is your your writing prompt for this week which is to write a poem about the objects that are the most important to you yeah the value you provide for yourself exactly 
So, esta semana les sugiero que escriban sobre los objetos, las cosas que para ustedes tienen el más alto valor. Y quizá también analicen la razón por qué tienen ese tipo de valor en su vida. You know, part of, I think, the reflection in this writing is going to be not just to write about the objects that you, you value the most, but why. Why are they so, so important to you? If it's a PlayStation 5, Abraham, you know, it's a PlayStation 5. It's a PS1. Mauricio, if it's a PS1, bro, hey, that's actually a classic right there. Make sure you hold on to that. That's all we can afford. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool Tekken yes I love that game Tekken 2 bro Tekken 2 oh, does anybody have any questions or any final comments <laughs> it's great it still works yeah exactly a lot of hints for Santa <laughs> yes Abraham uh, tomorrow's class, any information you want to leave on that? Yes. Thanks for the reminder. So I'm sure most of you at least saw the post on the stream for our class inviting you to be part of the new uh, workshop series that, um, that I'm leading with Abraham and Javier uh, Hernandez, the creator of El Muerto Comic. Um, Héroes de Los Ángeles is a workshop series that is uh, five weeks long, so it's not a very long one, but it's, it's basically a chance for everyone to tell us who your heroes are. And, you know, heroes can be people that are, you know, well-known. It could be somebody that you know for a fact has made a difference in the community. Um, but it can also be your own personal hero, somebody that had an impact on you and the work that you now do for the community. So I'm inviting you all to join us. Um, tomorrow is the first session. It's at 4.30 p.m. Um, it'll go from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Uh, of course, just like all of the other workshops, it will be recorded. So if you can't join us live, you can always watch the recording afterwards and still submit something. Um, but Héroes de Los Angeles is, is a project that we're doing to celebrate the heroes of our community the heroes that you recognize and that you nominate to be heroes. And Abraham and Javier and even me, uh, if necessary, um, they're going to be actually doing portraits, illustrated portraits of your heroes. And so not only will you get a chance to write a corrido, a short story, a poem um, that celebrates your hero, but uh, these t very talented visual artists are also going to be uh, honoring your hero with a drawing or an illustration. So you guys are welcome to join us. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've tried playing music in, in the background. It was the silencio might be kind of cool to, to play in the background, but it just doesn't come out good, man. I don't, I don't think the audio comes out very good. <laughs> but if you're interested, do look up It was the silencio. And join us for Héroes de Los Ángeles. It is on Google Classroom. There's a code that you'll need to use to register for it. Um, but that is up on the uh, uh, classroom now, on the stream now. Uh, is it a similar process to Conchas with writing prompts? Kind of similar, yes. Um, but it'll be much more focused on you writing about your hero. <laughs> I'm not gonna sing it, man. I'm sorry, you guys. My, my singing voice is probably not not worthy of Eros del Silencio. It's worthy of Silencio. <laughs> but um, absolutely. <laughs> All right. So, any uh, any questions or any other comments? Um, I'm sorry, I just want to get clear about the hero thing. Is it we're choosing one hero and then that's kind of like the theme for the entire 
for our work throughout the entire workshop or yeah yes. yes you'll choose a hero that you want to write about um, and I'm gonna be teaching basically four different ways to write about them so you can choose one of the four different ways and or you can do all four and they'll be published in an anthology accompanied by the illustrations that um, Abraham or Javier will do of your selected hero um, can you provide poems that you've already written that cover the topic that haven't submitted to Conchas y Café previously? I'm okay with that, um, but definitely be part of the workshop um, because who knows, you might want to update it or try something different. Um, and San Juanita, yes, the info is actually right now on the Google Classroom for Conchas y Café. I posted it, I believe, yesterday. Um, so you can see the, uh, the class code for uh, registering in Google Classroom. Uh, Caro, There's I think no I saw prep that. that has to be done for the first class of the week since it's tomorrow? Can no, no prep. To Tomorrow, tomorrow's like the introduction and it'll be the first lesson on how we uh, basically define heroes. So, um, Caro, I thought I saw your hand up. Do uh, you have any questions? Yes, the world needs heroes. I mean, the world is full of heroes, honestly. I don't think that we necessarily need them, um, but we do need to recognize them. So that's really the point of this workshop, is to recognize the heroes and to honor them. So, unsung heroes. Uh, so, si no hay alguna otra pregunta, um, I guess that'll be it for tonight. So thank you everybody for joining me tonight. Um, aquí los veo ojalá mañana para los que les interesa formar parte de Héroes de Los Ángeles que empieza mañana a las cuatro y media. Um, like I said, if you're not able to join us for Héroes de Los Ángeles uh, at 4.30 p.m. but would still like to join the workshop, you can. The lessons will be recorded and uploaded. Um, just like they are here for Conchas y Café, so you can still still participate. Um, y con eso, les digo, chao. Hasta mañana. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.